Okay, um, thank you all for coming. So, uh, I don't know what, um, what I'm supposed to say about the CV, but I, I joined WIDA three years ago and I was actually hired to work on the Fiscal States Project and also on the Domestic Savings Project. And three years ago, I started writing the paper and Yuta, my colleague, has been waiting for the paper for the last two years. It is 85% complete. I've just not been able to bring myself to finish the 15%. Hopefully with the comments today, I should be able to do that by the end of the year. And otherwise, I might lose my job or something. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is just to, um, Rose set the agenda of what we're trying to talk about here. So I'm not going to delve too much into the statistics on domestic savings or lack thereof in Cameroon, right? I'll just show you in terms of the econometrics what I was able to find. I added the role for institutions to the title. I haven't incorporated any measures of institutions yet, but it forms the 15% I just talked about earlier, and hopefully I can get that over the line. So in terms of the motivation, we know or oh, um, Kunal actually published a paper uh, quite a while back on the importance of investment in determining economic growth. And investment in itself is determined by savings. One of the primary determinants of high investment rates in countries are those countries that you know, have high savings. And if savings are high, then you are, the government can invest without having to borrow. And if investment is high, then growth is going to be higher. So this is the paper with World Development, um, which was published in 2004. Higher savings countries have faster or higher economic growth, as I've alluded to earlier. That's because those higher saving countries have more in terms of investment and they can invest and you know, spur their growth. But historically, there have been low savings, rate in, um, savings rates in sub-Saharan Africa, which have been dropping considerably over the years. Cameroon is one of those countries that has a high savings rate, but a low growth in savings. So in terms of the level of savings, it's relatively high given the economic structure, but the level has kind of stagnated over a while. It's not been growing as such. Hence why we see there's low growth in savings in Cameroon. So the aim of the paper is to decipher the determinants of domestic savings, that private savings and gross savings in Cameroon. So a bit of an overview of um, the Cameroonian economy. This isn't patented information, by the way. This can be found with the, found with the typical Wikipedia search. So it's a low, um, lower middle income country. Per capita GDP is um, at 1,499 US dollars, which was surprising to me when I saw it. Thought it was going to be much lower than that. The population is approximately 27 million. And the GDP growth rate for 2018 was at 4.1%, which was quite impressive for you know, the Central African countries. As it's typical of developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a huge informal sector, which you know, comprises about 90% of total employment, if you can call the total, you know, informal sector part of the employment sector. And um, it's mostly people operating in the primary sector, so agriculture and mining, querying, or just the very basic skills which are needed to produce in the primary sector. The government is the largest employer in the country, employing about 65% of the population. The World Bank data shows that the growth rate of the population is greater than the poverty reduction rate, and this is evident by the number of people who have been you know, brought into poverty over the years, exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. And there is also some civil strife in uh, Cameroon, the marginalized Anglophone regions where I emanate from, have been, you know, rowing with the government. So it's also um, contributing to the general lack of um, opportunities and the poverty which has been increasing in the country. So in terms of the fiscal policy framework, as expected, the government controls fiscal policy, which has generally been expansionary for the period of, uh, under review. So Cameroon um, has quite um, significant government spending, and to fund their spending, they don't raise as much in taxes as is expected, which is a you know, key theme we have in this conference. And they rely quite a lot on debt. Most of the debt is you know, um, resource-backed loans from China, but they also borrow from you know, bilateral and multilateral organizations, as well as international capital markets. Being a former colony of France, they do get a lot of grants from France as well, and technical assistance, but quite a significant amount of money in terms of loans. The fiscal system, 
is quite complicated, so it has a multiplicity of taxes, um, relatively high statutory rates, and um, I think the statutory CIT rate in Cameroon is 32%, which is quite high for a country without as many companies. But the effective tax rates which these companies pay sometimes go, um, goes lower than 15% because, you know, they benefit a lot from tax incentives and all kinds of tax exemptions. The country also lags in terms of infrastructural development with a lot of uncompleted projects or projects which are carried out in a substandard manner, which is, you know, the direct result of corruption in the country. The monetary policy framework is controlled by what we call BEAC. So in French, it's uh, Banque des États de l'Afrique Centrale, which is the bank for Central African states. So it serves as the central bank for Cameroon, as well as other countries in the CIMAC region. So that's Gabon, which just had a coup, by the way, Equatorial Guinea, Chad, the Republic of Congo, and Cameroon, and Central African Republic as well. So all these countries are being served by um, the BEAG, which is headquartered in Yaoundé. So the central bank conducts the monetary policy in a manner that ensures there is internal and external value of the CFA, which is the currency used by you know, Cameroon and the other CIMAC countries. So it does that by adjusting money supply through direct and indirect means, and it has a very strong imposition on reserve requirements. In terms of the financial sector policies, there are high levels of liquidity in Cameroon, and there's a very heavy concentration on deposit and loan activity and a low level of financial innovation. So the financial sector in Cameroon hasn't really tapped into the dividends, or they're not reaping the dividends of you know, the digitalized economy just yet. There's still very much um, loans and deposit kind of schemes. And a lot of what you have to do, for example, when civil servants have to get their salaries, unlike at WIDA where you just get a bank notification from Nordia, in Cameroon you have to queue up at the bank and then try to get your money in cash. So usually the salaries are paid by the 25th of the month and the you know, civil servants get very popular at the end of the month. But everybody has to queue up naturally and they've not really reaped the dividends of you know, digitalization in the country. The banking industry, of course, um, dominates the financial sector and there are 15 commercial banks. I think it's gone up to 18 now, but um, there is a you know, paucity of companies that are listed in the stock exchange, which is the Douala Stock Exchange in Cameroon. So the low rate of financial inclusion and increased informal financial services and credit unions are actually contributing to these low savings rates in the country. So there are low interest rates, small collateral requirements, lower levels of bureaucracy, but then the country is still not tapping into all the benefits of those low interest rates at the time. And as I mentioned earlier, there's low uptake in digitalization of financial services. So um, there are ATMs and um, a lot of the activities are now going digital. So you can actually do some transactions with your friends or with your collaborators without having to set foot in a bank. But it's still, it's at, it's at the nascent stages, you know, and it's fraught with complications. And there are very strong capital requirements in terms of what you can trade. So for example, I think the maximum of what you can trade in a day online goes up to about 300 euros. And if you have to do anything above 300 euros, then you have to go to the bank and take those long queues I was talking about. So we try to do some time series analysis to look at the determinants of private savings and gross savings, which we get from the World Development Indicators Database. The independent variables are following the literature. So we have the public savings rate, the interest rate, broad money, the log of GDP per capita, GDP per capita growth, inflation, terms of trade, population growth, and domestic credit to the private sector. What's important to uh, point out is that each of these variables has been postulated to influence savings in the literature, and there is really no consensus, the consensus view on the direction of effects per se. For example, terms of trade might have a positive impact on gross savings as well as it might have a negative impact. For things like the log of GDP per capita, you would expect that, you know, as your country becomes more developed, the financial sector expands, and then, you know, there is an uptick of digitalization. That's going to lead to an increase in all types of savings. But for the other variables, it's not immediately clear if it's going to be a positive or a negative effect. So the estimation strategy, we um, do some econometrics here, which I'm not going to delve into too much. 
the equation is based on the life cycle hypothesis, which again, I'm not going to talk about quite much, but it postulates that spending and saving habits of an economic agent are dependent on their future incomes over the course of their lifetimes. And this um, life cycle hypothesis was actually postulated by Kunal and his um, co-author in the paper in 2004, which has now been used you know, to um, talk about savings, private savings and national savings. So we employ what we call the autoregressive distributed lat technique. I'm not sure how familiar the audience is with, um, with this technique, but uh, I've just given some three points on you know, why I think it's a suitable technique for that. But um, to avoid us having a very long and tangential discussion, we can talk about the econometrics of a coffee. But one of the attractive points is it's suitable for time series analysis covering you know, a shorter sample. Our sample is from 1980 to 2018, so that's quite long. But if it were shorter than that, the ARDL would be suitable for that. It's also very good because you have a mixture of variables, what we refer to as I0 and I1 processes. So for those who are familiar with the time series literature, it means that it's a mixture of what we call stationary variables, variables that revert to the mean after a few deviations, and non-stationary variables, which are typically trending over time. So for example, um, the tax to GDP ratio is typically a non-stationary variable because it's very sticky and it trends over time. Government spending as well is typically a non-stationary variable because it's always trending over time. And uh, it's very rare to find government spending reduced. You know, it typically increases over time. And another attractive aspect of the method, it permits distinction between the short-run um, short effects and the long run effects of independent variables, which you know is quite important. So as a precursor to actually estimating the empirics, we do some stationarity testing. So we want to know if the variables are I0 or if they're I1. This is just so we know how to develop the long run model. If, for example, all the variables are I0, which means that they are stationary, then we don't have to worry about the long run model. Everything reduces to a short run model. But if we have a mixture of both, then we need to have the optimal lag length, which is chosen using information criteria. And then the lag length is going to determine how much of a long run and short run relationship we're going to have. So what we would find here, where you see the stars, it means that you know the variable is um, I, I0. Without the stars, then the variable is I1. So as you'd see, there is a mixture of I0 variables and I1 variables which is perfectly fine. If you used an alternative method like the vector autoregression, you would naturally want all your variables to be I1. That means you would want them to be trending over time such that you can reparameterize it into an error correction model. But because we're using the ARDL, we don't mind having I0 and I1 variables together in the equation. A very fundamental part of applying this ARDL model is testing for co-integration. So you have the Pesaran et al. 2001 bounds test for co-integration. So the null hypothesis is that there is no long-run relationship between variables. And by that I mean there is no co-integration between variables. The alternative or the alternate, um, alternative hypothesis is that there is a long-run relationship between variables. And what we want to be able to prove is that we can reject the null of no long run relationship between variables. We want to be able to show that in the long run, these variables move together or the variables are related. So the interpretation of this bounds test, you look at what we call the F statistic. If the F statistic is greater than the critical values, we reject the null hypothesis. So if you look at this, I hope you can see from the back, the F statistic is consistently greater than the critical values at 1%, 5%, and 10% for private savings, which shows that we can reject the null of no um, long-run relationship between variables, which demonstrates that the variables are co-integrated. We see the same thing for the gross savings equation, where the F statistic is consistently higher than the critical values at 1%, 5%, and 10%, again, demonstrating that we can reject the null hypothesis of no long-run relationship between variables and conclude that the variables indeed have a long-run relationship, hence they are co-integrated. So this is the co-integration test for private savings, the co-integration test for gross savings, 
and then we look at the long run estimate. So for each dependent variable, there are four different specifications and various independent variables that are introduced progressively. Um, I don't know if you can see this from the back, but um, the first independent variable is the adjustment term, which is what we refer to as the error correction term. Because we are doing a long run and short run model, that adjustment term is significant and negative, which shows that if there is a shock to the system, the country can always revert to its long run levels. Public savings um, have a negative relationship on private savings. So if your public savings increase, it naturally leads to a reduction in private savings because you know people don't feel or oh, there's no pressure exerted for them to save as much anymore. The interest rates are negative and significant at one point, which of course is quite intuitive, right? If interest rates are quite high, people don't get to save. If the interest rates are lower, then the people will get to save. GDP per capita is positive, which um, when you include GDP per capita, it's kind of a proxy of the level of development and, you know, um, improvement in financial services, improvement in digitalization and all that. So it's kind of a catch-all for everything which may not be quantifiable, but which are characteristic of a country that's, you know, in development. And it's expected to have a positive relationship. GDP per capita growth, uh, that's a bit different. Sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive. So if a country is growing again, it might demonstrate that there are other aspects, you know, which are not quantifiable, which are going to increase private savings, maybe in terms of the number of banks which are now there, in terms of the kinds of services which are offered. But then it might also be a negative relationship such that the growth in the country is funded almost entirely by the government and then it leads to a reduction in private savings. So that's some kind of social fiscal contract where people don't get to save as much anymore because they can depend more on the government, which is demonstrated by an increase in growth with the government, you know, as a proxy for the government improving as well. Domestic credit to the private sector is, you know, a proxy for financial sector development and as expected, it has a positive relationship. So gross savings, Again, you see that the adjustment term is negative and significant. GDP per capita is also, you know, um, positive and significant. The idea about GDP per capita growth still applies here. It can be positive, which is to be expected, which shows that the country has been improving and, you know, um, whatever that entails, as well as it can be negative, which shows a different kind of fiscal contract where people tend to depend a bit more on the government and then savings don't increase. And the government doesn't save as much either because it has to spend a bit more. Broad money um, is also a proxy for you know, a money supply, which of course increases savings. The interest rates again are negative, so higher interest rates and you know, lower savings and all. When you look at the um, um, things at the end, so the diagnostic tests, are used to ascertain the you know, stability of the model. So we have a Dobbin-Watson statistic and then we have the bruch godfrey test and both fail to reject the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation. So this is a time series model, so autocorrelation is always going to be an issue and being able to reject the null hypothesis, uh, sorry, being unable to reject the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation is quite important. We also have to test for homoscedasticity and for that we use the bruch pagan test and the test also fails to reject the null hypothesis of homoscedastic errors, which is also quite important. In terms of structural stability tests, you do the Kusum square test, and the Kusum square falls within the 5% confidence bound, hence the model estimates are stable. So these are the references um, from the African Development Bank and some of the papers published on Cameroon, which might you know, give you more of an idea of the issue. And um, that's the end of my presentation. I've touched something crazy here. Yeah? Mm -hmm.